Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. We continue with our uh, discussion of traditions in world cinema and the topic is British New Wave Cinema. How many of us are aware of the so called British New Wave Cinema or even the British cinema? <coughs> Surprisingly, uh, we get very little response whenever we try to discuss British cinema and particularly British New Wave Cinema which had made an important contribution to the tradition towards the tradition of world cinema. So, um, the beginning is the end of the 1950s which witnessed the advent in Europe of a succession of new waves. We have been talking about the French new wave, we also know German expressionism, uh, Italian neorealism. So, British new wave and this was the part of your succession of new waves in cinema all across Europe. Uh, it was marked by the growth of innovative productions and characterized by emergence of young film directors and writers. Generally it all lasted till the 70s. The British new wave movement refers to a trend that took place in the British film industry in the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, it drew inspiration from the works of French directors such as Francois Truffaut and Jean Louis Godard, amongst others, who were the pioneers, as you know, of the Nouvelle Vogue or the French New Wave cinema. Now, British cinema, New Wave is concerned with deconstructing realism and the aesthetics associated with it. The films between 1959 and 63, 1963 are collectively known as the British New Wave and sometimes also the kitchen sink drama. This is a new term you should know, the kitchen sink drama and the British uh, realism, social realism. Developments in the British film industry had from the beginning very strong literary roots. British New Cinema was an extension of the changes in subject matter, style and themes that had first taken place during the 50s in poetry, novels and stage drama. Okay, so, at the major all the major productions of the major new wave were literary adaptations. According to the critic, film critic uh, and uh, scholar Peter Wallen, contrary to the French practice, the British series of films is not marked by the leadership of a group of prominent authors. Uh, Wollen calls the young English cinema more literary than its French counterpart and that British cinema is not author based. Still, if a new wave cinema is defined as a youth oriented national uh, movement of the period, then the 50s and the 60s can be qualified as a British new wave. Since the late 30s, the British film industry had experienced three decades of continuous crisis the crisis was averted occasionally by the fixing of quotas and the imposition of high duties on competing films imported from Hollywood. The situation was that people did, did not want to watch uh, films made in Britain uh, as compared to the high production values uh, and glossy films of Hollywood, the studio films. It was also the time, you know, when uh, uh, even the greatest of all film actors such as uh, um, uh, Laurence Olivier and Vivian Leigh, they were seeking um, uh, you know, careers in Hollywood cinema. Of course, they were great British stars also and continued making films in Britain, but they did make wonderful films in Hollywood. Um, before we all forget, we have to remember how Vivian Leigh was particularly discovered by uh, the makers of the classic Gone with the Wind and uh, although she was an established actor um, in British cinema and also a very under renowned actress on the British stage and theatre, 
but she had to go and prove herself and there was there were lot of you know there are lots of legendary stories related to how Vivian Lee was cast as the great character Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. So the, <coughs> so the idea is that so the idea is that um, British film industry always had to compete with Hollywood with uh, very little success or rather no success okay they just people just couldn't compete with Hollywood cinema and uh, the greatest of all stars were also seeking fortunes and careers in uh, Hollywood so the idea was what to do how to compete with all this now some of the act directors whose body of works can be associated with the so called British new wave are Tony Richardson, J Jack Clayton and John Schlesinger, Lindsay Anderson, Ken Loesch and Desmond Davis. As with the French New Wave movement, many of these filmmakers begin, begin as movie critics and film journalists. We have been talking about the lasting impression of the French New Wave cinema and this was one of the uh, influences, this was one of the consequences. So, these British filmmakers were affiliated with prominent left wing political journals and magazines such as Sequence, uh, the New Statesman and the British Film Institute Sight and Sound. They were influenced by a normative idea of cinema, a vision of what cinema should be and this was that British cinema needed to break away from its class bound attitudes. You see the British society has always been marked by uh, a definite class system and the idea was that there should be uh, culturally there should be a kind of a revolution where class system should break down, barriers should break down and cinema and theatre made their own contribution towards breaking these or crossing these barriers. I will be talking repeatedly about some of these films of this uh, period, look back in anger, a taste of honey, Billy Liar and the L shaped room. The movie Hard Day's Night uh, starring the great Beatles, okay, the rock band, the pop band Beatles, it marked the end of the movement although uh, th this is uh, uh, a very fitting tribute to the British new wave, one needs to watch um, Hard Day's Night just in order to understand the things that we have been talking about with the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the key features of the French new wave cinema, you know shooting on location, camera fluidity of camera movement and uh, uh, shooting in natural light with mostly employing natural sound, Beatles playing themselves in a very personal kind of filmmaking. Okay. So, we will come back uh, to the common themes in the uh, uh, works of these directors and examine some of their films a little later in this talk, in this lecture. So, changes in literary environment of the period are very significant when we consider the British new wave. In the beginning of the 1950s, the anti-modernist writers such as C. P. Snow and J. B. Priestley, they expressed a preference for social relevance and provincialism. This style of literary tradition was supported by uh, poets such as Philip Larkin and Tom Gunn. Novels such as John Wayne's uh, Hurry On Down uh, along with Kingsley and Mrs. Lucky Jim, they dealt with dissatisfied young men from the provinces, from working class areas. The literary event of this era of course was John Osborne's classic play Look Back in Anger, uh, which was staged in 1956, featuring the disgruntled protagonist Jimmy Porter, who was described as the first of the so called angry young men. So, you have to use this, you have to re un remember this term, the expression angry young men first used by uh, uh, in British cinema to describe uh, a disgruntled young man who is extremely anti-establishment. You know, we have our own version of angry young man as we have seen in the films of Amitabh Bachchan in the early 70s and again it is a throwback on these kinds of films where a young person was anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian and uh, um, he had uh, 
an axe to grind with, with uh, uh, the social injustices of the period. So, British new wave cinema, uh, we have also talk, uh, used an expression kitchen sink realism. Uh, uh, it, so, it is referred to as kitchen sink realism for its attention to class is one of its central themes. Class and class conflict came to be one of the central defining themes of the new wave movement. For the first time class came to be a subject in itself and not a source of comic relief as was uh, seen in the works of earlier playwrights and filmmakers. Uh, important literary works and most of these literary works are later adapted into films. Ellen Silito's Saturday Night and Saturday, Sunday Morning, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Learn Runner, then David Story's This Sporting Life, John Brain's Room at the Top, Lynn Reed Banks, The L-Shaped Room and Elliot George's The Leather Boys and of course, Billy Lyre which was Keith Waterhouse's. In particular, these films uh, paid close attention to the uh, uh, nitty gritties of uh, everyday life of uh, and the working of the working classes and the, uh, the, the highs, their lows, their lives, their loves. Of great importance is the fact that working classes were portrayed neither as victims nor as heroes, but as people with everyday lives through the use of domestic and leisure time settings in the films. This represented a break from earlier cinema that shied away from representation of the industrial north and the midlands and the use of local accents on screen. Until the new wave, most of the characters in British cinema were from London and spoke in the accents of the educated upper class. You have to think of uh, the way how accent marks class and most of the films before the British new wave. Uh, starring upper class characters and uh, using upper class accents, the standard RP received pronunciation of the English language, but this was the first time where uh, the characters, the protagonists started speaking the working class accents and also the regional dialects and also uh, particularly in a cockney language. So, this was this uh, had to be accepted and uh, Definitely, this was uh, a period when things were changing in Britain. So, in addition to class, the frustration and rebellion of the youth and sex and gender relations were also prominent themes of these films. What was unique about the British New Wave was the great emphasis it laid on the social environment, its tre treatment of uh, sex and sexuality, the focus on the youth culture, their frustrations and the dominant political attitudes, especially after the second world war. There is a remarkable am amount of overlap between the British new wave movement and the angry young men movement in British literature. This movement refers to playwrights and novelists who shot to prominence in the 1950s. We are again talking about people like Osborne and Tony Richardson. Again the key concerns of their works was also. Uh, were also a disillusionment with traditional society. Their work sought to draw attention to the working classes in the north of England, earning the description it is grim up north. A large number, uh, a large number of the canonical films that were made uh, in this period were adaptations of earlier plays or novels that had captured the hard conditions of the working classes, especially after the wars. In the time where the people were assumed to never had it better, these films came to be seen as almost anarchic. They rocked the boat that things were not all that good in Britain, but there was a section of society that was living under extremely trying conditions. The marker that sets apart the British New Wave films are the stylistic conventions it followed. A few of them uh, worth mentioning are like most of the films are shot in black and white. This is important that these films, even A Hard Day's Night, um, which was made in 1963, starring the Beatles, it is a, a black and white film. And it followed a pseudo documentary style of shooting, shows, showing clear references to the cinema verite mode of filmmaking. In addition, these films are often shot on location, just like the French New Wave films.
with real people or non-professional actors and focused on the process of capturing real life. For example, Room at the Top was shot in Bradford and a, test, a Taste of Honey in Manchester and Blackpool among real locations. And of course, Billy Liar in the, street, uh, in the streets of Bradford and Leeds. Again, sound was dubbed and the musical score was locally influenced as well. Unlike the major movies of the time, these movies were often shot in 16 mm. As a result, these films often had a very spontaneous quality and came to embody what is today known as earthy realism. The idea of subjective reality found a lot of favor with such cinema. Audiences were allowed into the minds of characters through the use of interior monologues. Point of view shots and subjective camera work allowed the audience to see what the characters could. The purpose was to lay bare his or her character in detail. It is worth no, uh, making the distinction here between socialist realism and the kind of concerns that British New Wave cinema addressed, often termed social realism. Unlike the former, the British New Wave was not produced under supervision by the government and did not aspire to the status of official art. In addition, the protagonist of social realism was often the anti-hero and was not portrayed as an ideal type worthy of emulation. He or she was dissatisfied with life and work and often frustrated in their quest for better. Provincial life was portrayed as claustrophobic and alienating. Um, so, uh, some of the uh, important movies, I mean again I will talk about Look Back in Anger, Taste of Honey, Billy Liar and um, uh, particularly made in uh, 1959 by Tony Richardson, Look Back in Anger. It is starred Richard Burton, Mary Ewer and Claire Bloom. Base, it is based on as we have been talking about John Osborne's play and the film is a love triangle between an intelligent young man Jimmy Porter his upper middle class wife Alison and her snobbish best friend Helena. Set in Derby, the plot explores many questions about love, sex and morality against the background of class that underpins the surface of working class life. The main character uh, that is Jimmy Porter, he came to symbolize the so called angry young man and offered an insight to the anger, boredom and frustration felt by the British working class. The second movie, A, Ta a Taste of Honey, uh, which is also uh, an adaptation of a play by Shilak Delany was directed by, again by Tony Richardson. The movie stars um, Rita Teshingham as Joe and a pregnant 17 year old school girl uh, and Murray Melvin as Jeffrey, her homosexual flatmate and friend. The relationship between the two is the centerpiece of the movie. A large part of the film's commentary involves question of motherhood, sexuality and race explored through the character of Joe. The movie was critically acclaimed for the manner in which it drew attention to such issues. And then there was Billy Liar which was made in 1963 starring Tom Courtney and Mo Washburn. The film was directed by John Schlesinger and is an adaptation of a novel by the same name. The story revolves around funeral furnishing seller Billy Fisher who dreams of escaping to London to become a comedy writer. Billy chooses to escape his reality through his Walter Mitty's imagination using it as a crutch to uh, help him cope with his feeling of claustrophobia and alienation. The real world in Billy's life leaves much to be desired and his quest to do better gives us an insight to his life. So, these film, uh, films are basically canonical works for the way in which they dealt with the themes that came to be associated with British New Wave. In addition, this subtly brings up issues that were taboo at the time such as unwed pregnancies, homosexualities, race relations, etc., uh, work, you know, working class conditions and told in gritty terms. And in doing all this, they gave us a critical insight into the British New Wave and its importance. Uh, another film that I wanted to talk about is This Sporting Life, nine, which was released in 1963. 
directed by Lindsay Anderson. It was adapted from a novel by David Story and it has strong northern working class credentials. Story himself was a miner's son who like his novels hero had played rugby in a northern town. The writer had a disdain for the typical which is especially demonstrated in the film's presentation of its two principal characters, the rugby player Frank Machin and his uh, landlady and uh, occasional lover Mrs. Hammond. So, Frank is full of masculine aggression and Mrs. Hammond represents feminine restraint. The film is, a, is unique in the way it puts a distance between itself and the earlier new wave films. The quality of the film dwells in the awkwardness which seems to parallel uh, Frank's own awkwardness and lack of articulation which is again a hallmark of the, uh, the so called angry young man, lack of articulation, frustration, aggression, suppressed aggression, overt and covert aggression. By 1963 as we have been talking about the British new wave uh, was on its last legs and its major players such as Jack Clayton and Tony Richardson turned to other kinds of production but they had a lasting impression, they had, a, they had left a legacy on the directors that followed them. So, we had people like John Schlesinger's Sunday Bloody Sunday, Carol Reese's The French Lieutenant's Woman and Lindsay Anderson's If. A new generation came into prominence with people such as Ken Loge, um, Danny Boyle and Mike Lay. So, these directors have kept the tradition of social realism alive and communicate directly to the contemporary world. Think and uh, films like uh, you know uh, train spotting. Okay. So, the British cinema continues to talk to speak with the contemporary world. Thank you very much and we will we will meet again in our next class.